Ladies and gentlemen, equity markets around the world have witnessed very, very strong rallies right through 2023. We are now in 2024 and there are no signs that this rally is about to slow down anytime soon. But wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to predict how long this rally is likely to go on for and at what point in time this rally is likely to fizzle out. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, there's good news because that's precisely what we are going to explore during the course of this episode. In this video, we are going to explore a very interesting investment strategy that is based on three very sophisticated market inflection points and parameters that is likely to help us navigate this ongoing market rally up until that proverbial market peak and is also likely to help us very reliably get out the equity markets before the a material correction kicks in. Ladies and gentlemen, hi, my name is Indranil Guha and I'm one of the co-founders of Metacaps.ai, which is an AI-driven personal finance platform. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last one and a half months, I've been talking about a bunch of key market inflection points and market parameters, which have historically been very, very useful in predicting the onset of recessions and the stock market crashes that typically accompany recessions. In this episode, I'm going to consolidate and summarize the learning from the last three episodes of this series to come up with a robust and actionable investment strategy that can potentially help you navigate this ongoing rally almost till the very end when the market will make its eventual top and then help potentially also help you get, safely get out of the markets well in advance before an eventual market crash starts to materialize so that you're protected from the adverse impacts of a steep market correction. So ladies and gentlemen, please do watch this episode till the very end because I promise this is going to be a hell of a hell of an episode. The three key inflection points and market parameters that I'm going to depend on to build this uh, investment strategy are first, the RRP, the balance in the RRP facility or the reverse repo facility. Secondly, the peak in the Fed funds rate or the FFR. And finally, last but not the least, yield curve inversion. So let's get on with these three one by one. The first parameter that we are going to discuss based on which we can potentially time the Nifty is the balance in something called the reverse repo facility or the RRP. The RRP has been one of the primary sources of liquidity for almost every asset market in the world. The primary beneficiary of the liquidity support provided by the RRP over the last one year has in fact been equity markets, most of which has ma have managed to scale new all-time highs over the last one year because of the liquidity support provided by the RRP. But this is an exception. RRP has historically not been the primary source of liquidity during the course of previous liquidity driven rallies in the past. And that's why I want to start by first explaining how have liquidity driven rallies historically played out earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, historically liquidity driven rallies have almost always been triggered as a result of global central banks, especially led by the Federal Reserve in the US, which is the central bank of the US printing a lot of money and flooding the financial system with a lot of liquidity. Let me explain that with the help of a chart. What you see on your screen right now is the chart that represents the size of the Fed's balance sheet size. What is the Fed? Fed is the central bank of the US, the equivalent of RBI in the United States. And the Fed's balance sheet basically represents, in layman language, it represents the amount of new dollars that the Fed has printed into existence over the last 15 years. That's what this chart represents. This chart also shows us that over the course of last 15 years, there have been two distinct periods when the rate of money printing by the Fed has spiked very, very significantly. First time this happened was in the aftermath of the recession of 2008. The second time this happened was in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. On both these occasions, you can see that the red line went up at a very, very fast pace. The red line going up at a very fast pace basically means that the Fed is printing money at a very fast pace during this period. The process of Fed printing money at a very aggressive pace is also called quantitative easing, QE. 
So we had QE happening after 2008 as well as after the COVID pandemic. Why did the Fed have to print so much money after 2008 and after 2020? Because on these two occasions, the US economy witnessed some of the worst recessions in living memory. And in order to provide liquidity support to the US economy and the equity markets during these distressed times, the Fed had to step in and print a lot of money during these times. What was the impact of all this money printing on equity markets? Well, the impact of money printing on equity markets have, has historically been always very, very positive, not just for US equity markets, but pretty much for equity markets around the world, including here in India. And we can very clearly see that if we overlay the chart of the Nifty on this graph, the blue line that I have added here is the chart of the Nifty. And as you can see, on both the occasions when the Fed printed money at a very fast pace, the Nifty did very well. We, strong, we saw very strong rallies in the Nifty on both these occasions. During these highlighted periods, the red line went up at a very fast pace and the blue line, the Nifty went up in tandem. So there is a very tight correlation uh, between the two. Whenever you have money printing happening in the US, that has a very, very positive impact on equity markets here in India. But ladies and gentlemen, we are right now in 2024 and this is not the time when the Fed is printing money and adding to the liquidity. In fact, as we speak, the Fed is conducting what is called QT, quantitative tightening. This is a period when the Fed is cutting liquidity rather than add to the liquidity. And historically, the Fed cutting liquidity can never be a good thing for equity markets. And yet, what we have had over the last one year is that equity markets around the world have done phenomenally well. So there's a huge disconnect between the liquidity posture adopted by the Fed and how equity markets have been performing. Despite the Fed cutting liquidity very, very aggressively, we have equity markets doing very, very well. So what exactly is the source of this disconnect? The primary source of this the reason why this disconnect exists is this entity or account called the reverse repo facility. It's an account maintained by the Fed itself. Before I explain to you what exactly is the reverse repo facility, I need to take you back to this chart that I showed you a little while back. As I told you, in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, the Fed stepped in and printed a humongous amount of money because of which this red line went up very, very sharply between 2020 and 2021. What happened to all this money? Most of this money first went to the US government and then the US government used a good part of this money to provide support to US citizens who were adversely who had been adversely impacted by the COVID pandemic, especially those who had lost their jobs because of the COVID pandemic. Such affected citizens received direct cash transfers from the US government into their bank accounts. And these transfers happened at a very, very large scale. And because of these large scale bank, direct bank transfers into the bank account of citizens, the amount of that cash that came into the banking system, the amount of deposits that went, came into the banking system, that really went through the roof. And when so much deposit comes into the banking system within a short period of time, think about what is the impact of that that is going to have, uh, what is the impact that is going to have, uh, have on the interest rates offered by banks to their depositors. Well, the interest rates are going to crash to practically zero because if you think about it, if there's too much deposit coming into the banking system, then banks wouldn't be fe wouldn't feel compelled to offer high interest rate to their depositors in order to attract deposit because there's already a deluge of deposits coming into the banks. And that's why the interest offered by most banks during the COVID pandemic practically collapsed to zero. Now, in this backdrop, the Fed restarted or reactivated this account or facility whatever you might wish to call it this facility was called the reverse repo facility now anybody could park their cash in in the reverse repo facility and the fed would pay you a small interest on that balance and this interest would be slightly higher than what the banks were paying at that point in time at that point in time banks were paying their depositors practically zero interest if you parked your cash in the RRP, the Fed would pay you 0.15% per annum. So it was a small, it was a negligible difference, but it was a slightly higher interest rate that you could earn by parking your cash in the RRP. But this 0.15% per annum interest was what the RRP was offering to begin with back in 2021. Since then, of course, inflation in the US has 
gone up significantly and in response to that the fed had to hike interest rates very significantly and as the fed started hiking interest rate the interest that the fed started offering to depositors in the rrb facility also started to go up and as we speak right now the interest offered by the fed on the rrp balances has gone gone up to as high as 5.3 percent per annum which is a very very attractive interest rate by u.s standards and because of the very high interest rate offered by the fed on the rrp facility a lot of money flowed into the rrp facility between 2021 and 2023 as you can see in this chart this chart represents the balance in the rrp over time to begin with in early 2021 the balance in the rrp was practically zero but as interest rate offered by the Fed on the RRP balances kept started to go up, the record amounts of flows came into the RRP and by early 2023, the RRP balance went to an all-time high of $2.37 trillion. That's a humongous liquidity pool that the Fed was able to create over a two-year period by offering a slap higher interest rate on the RRP balances and this liquidity pool could now provide liquidity support to rest of the US financial system and that's exactly what happened from the middle of 2023 onwards from middle of 2023 onwards we have had almost 1.9 trillion dollars flow out of the RRP into global asset markets and these outflows have provided liquidity support to almost every asset market in the world. For context, 1.9 trillion dollars worth of cumulative outflows from the RRP since the middle of last year translates to a monthly rate of almost 200 billion dollars worth of outflows every month. Now the Fed has been conducting QT and has been cutting liquidity in the process at a rate of about $95 billion, almost $100 billion per month. Against this, the RRP has been replenishing liquidity at a rate of about $200 billion per month. So the RRP has fully offset the impact of the Fed cutting liquidity. In fact, we are in since the middle of last year, because of these outflows, we have been in a net liquidity positive condition and because of this net liquidity positive positive condition almost every risk asset in the world has benefited over the last one year especially equity markets around the world most equity markets around the world have managed to scale new all-time highs as a result of the liquidity support they have received from the rrp but ladies and gentlemen this party cannot go on forever because of the scale of these outflows the balance that is left in the RRP now is just $438 billion from a peak of $2.37 trillion. We are now down to just $438 billion. So almost 80% of the balance in the RRP is now gone. And the, even this remaining $438 billion that is left at the rate that the RRP is getting drained could well be gone in the next eight to nine weeks. And once the RRP gets fully exhausted, there will be no source of liquidity left in the US financial system that can offset the impact of the Fed cutting liquidity as part of its quantitative tightening program. And at that stage, there could be very, very serious risks to the ongoing rally in the, in the Nifty. Now, I'm not trying to necessarily suggest that there will almost certainly be a crash in the Nifty once the RRP balance goes to zero. There's a whole bunch of outcomes that is possible and I have explored all these outcomes in very many details in the dedicated video I did on RRP just about uh, two weeks back. So please go and have a look at that. But one of the outcomes that is possible is surely that, that once the RRP balance goes to zero, we could see some volatility in equity markets. So in the light of that, how should we play the equity markets in the run up to the RRP getting fully depleted? Well, the RR, well, well, this ongoing rally clearly has legs to continue as long as there is uh, gas left in the RRP tank because the RRP is pretty much the fuel tank which has been fueling this ongoing rally and we have about $438 billion worth of liquidity still left in this gas tank to fuel the ongoing rally. So there is no imminent risk of this, rally, of this rally fizzling out at least for the next 8 to 9 months. So one clear common sense strategy that we can adopt is that we can continue to participate in this rally and stay invested at least till the time there is comfortable balance in the RRP. 
But once the RRP balance starts to dwindle down to zero or close to zero, that's the point where the risk of equity market volatility starts to rise very dramatically. And that stage, we could adopt a posture of cutting our equity exposure and move, and move our portfolio to something more defensive. So this could be one strat this could be a common sense strategy to play the equity markets over the na next 8 to 10, 10 weeks as the remaining balance in the RRP gets depleted. Now the next parameter that we are going to discuss based on which we can potentially time the nifty is called the Fed funds rate or the FFR. Now FFR is something on which I have already done a dedicated video. I'm going to leave a link of that video in the description of this video and I strongly encourage you to have a look at that video. What I'm going to do at this stage is going to do a very quick summary of what I had covered in that video. So what is the Fed and what is the Fed funds rate? Well, the Fed of course is the Federal Reserve Bank of the US. It is the central bank of US, the equivalent of Reserve Bank of India in the United States. And one of the primary functions of the Fed is to set the level of interest rates in the for the US economy. And it does so by setting the level of what is called the Fed funds rate or the FFR. Fed funds rate is arguably the most important interest rate in the US economy. When the Fed hikes Fed funds rate, the effect of that is interest rate on home loans, car loans, business loans and practically every category of loans starts to go up after that and once the fed starts to cut fed funds rate the effect of that is that there is a transmission of these rate cuts across all interest rates in the us usually after that interest rate on home loans car loans business loans usually starts to come down the chart that you see on your screen right now illustrates the way the fed funds rate has moved up and down over the last 20 years as you can see from 2004 onwards, the Fed started to hike Fed funds rate and Fed funds rate eventually peaked around June of 2006. What is the implication of Fed funds rate peaking? Usually once Fed funds rate peak, that means that we are drawing towards the end of a business cycle. And what is it that we get at the end of a business cycle? Usually a business cycle ends with a recession in the US economy. And sure enough, the peaking of Fed funds rate around June of 2006 paved the way for a recession that was witnessed in the US economy from early 2008 onwards, January 2008 onwards to be more precise. And once the US economy was faced with the recession, the Fed was forced to cut Fed funds rate. And as you can see, Fed funds rate was cut to almost zero and it stayed at zero all the way up to 2015 and from 2015 onwards the economy started to show signs of a revival and as the economy started to show signs of a revival the fed once again started to hike rates and in this cycle the fed funds rate ultimately peaked around december of 2018 and yet again the peaking of the fed funds rate paved the way for the next recession in the us which was triggered in early 2020 alongside the onset of the covid pandemic why does all this matter at this stage this matters at this stage especially because we have had yet another peak in fed funds rate around july of 2023 if historical precedence is anything to go by, then this could well mean that we could get a recession in the US in a not too distant future. Now, what is the impact of Fed funds rate peaking on equity markets, especially here for Indian equity markets? Well, as we saw, once the Fed funds rate peaks, that eventually paves the way for the next recession. To understand the impact of that on Indian equity markets, I have overlaid the chart of the Nifty here. The blue line that you see here illustrates how the Nifty has moved over the, over the last 20 years and this chart especially highlights how the Nifty has behaved in the aftermath of Fed funds rate peaking. As you can see, after Fed funds rate peaked in June of 2006, it was followed by a recession from January 2008 onwards and this recession paved the way for a very very painful 60% correction in the Nifty here in India. The next time Fed funds rate peaked was in December of 2018 and this was followed by a recession in early 2020 and this recession triggered a massive 38% correction 
in the nifty here in india so very clearly once the fed fund rates peak in the us that leads to a recession in the us and a recession in the us triggers a stock market correction not just in the us but as this chart shows triggers stock market correction pretty much around the world including here in india and the implication is very clear if you have got yet another fed funds rate peak here and this could this in turn eventually paves the way for the next recession then there is a very high risk that we could get a large stock market correction here in india in a not too distant future now what is it that our strategy should be now that fed funds rate have peaked and this more or less confirms the fact that at some point in time in a not too distant future we'll get a recession in the us which in turn will trigger a large stock market correction should we sell all our stocks and go to a very very defensive posture ladies and gentlemen the short answer is no because usually there is a significant lag between the point at which the fed funds rate peaks and the point when the stock market makes a top and during this intervening period as we are going to see by way of a few charts the stock market usually rallies very strongly during this intervening period so for example fed funds rate peaked for the first time in this century in june of 2006 but the stock market here in india continued to rally for 19 months after that the stock market rally went on till january of 2008 Once again, in twenty before COVID, the Fed funds rate peak came in around December of twenty eighteen, but the Nifty continued to rally for thirteen months after that, all the way till January of twenty twenty. And what's the quantum of the rally in this intervening periods between two thousand six and two thousand and eight? As you can see in this chart, the Nifty rallied a staggering hundred and ten percent. Hundred and ten percent rally means the Nifty more than doubled during this period. What happened uh, after the Fed funds rate peaked in December of twenty eighteen? After December twenty eighteen, over the next thirteen months, the Nifty rallied by thirteen percent. Well. this is this is a significant rally but it, this is clearly the quantum of this rally is not as large as the one that was witnessed between 2006 and 2008 and that in my opinion is because the rally after december 2018 was cut short by the abrupt onset of the covid pandemic had it not been for the onset of the covid pandemic i believe the rally after december 2018 would have gone on for longer and the scale of the rally could well have been comparable to the scale of the rally that was witnessed between june of 2006 and january and january of 2008 so what is it that we have witnessed in the nifty since the most recent instance of fed funds rate peaking well the most recent instance of fed funds rate peaking came in around july of 2023 and since then we have seen the nifty rally already by about 13% and this 13% rally has come in in just the last 8 to 9 months so in annualized terms the scale of the rally is has been still higher So if you are planning to time your exit from the equity markets then definitely it's not a very good idea to time your exit right at the point where fed funds rate peaks out of the fear that we are going to get a recession at some point in time because had you done that then historically you would have missed out on some very strong rallies in the nifty for example you would have missed out on this 110% rally that was witnessed in the nifty between june of 2006 and january of 2008 you would have missed out on this 13% rally that was witnessed in the nifty between december 2018 and january of 2020 and you would have probably also missed out on this 13% rally that happened in the nifty after july of 2023 but if the point where fed funds rate peak if that's not the best time to time one's exit from the equity markets is there a better time to plan one's exit from the equity markets in the run up to a recession well historically if you are indeed looking to time your exit from the equity markets then the better time to do that is the point where the fed starts cutting fed funds rate rather than the point where fed funds rate peak let's understand that using the next chart before the recession of 2008 the fed started cutting fed funds rate from september 2007 onwards and we see that equity markets made a top within just 4 months of that in january of 2008 Once again, before COVID, the Fed started cutting Fed funds rate from August 2019 onwards, 
and we saw that equity markets made a top within just five months of this happening so very clearly as we can see once the fed starts cutting fed funds rate we see equity markets making a top within a very short period of time and hence to that extent if at all you are planning to time your exit from the equity markets then the point where the fed starts cutting fed funds rate is a much better time to do so compared to the point where the fed where fed funds rate peak because usually by the time the fed starts cutting fed funds rate bulk of the equity market rally is over and usually equity markets make a top within a very short period of time after that now based on this what should be our strategy now that the fed funds rate has peaked for the most recent cycle as we as we can see fed funds rate peaked around july of 2023 what should be our, be our strategy at this stage? Now, going by the historical precedence, the strategy is very clear. One needs to stay fully invested after the in equity markets after the point Fed funds rate peak because usually the the last leg of the rally, equity rally, which is also usually the strongest leg of the strongest part of the equity rally, that kicks in after Fed funds rate peak and what we have seen over the last one year is pretty much in line with that a very strong rally has been witnessed in nifty since the time fed funds rate peaked around july of 2023 and we need to stay invested at least till the point fed funds rates fed starts cutting fed funds rate now nobody knows when exactly the fed will start to cut fed funds rate so far they have only announced that they are going to cut about three times during the course of 2024 they have not announced when exactly they will start cutting fed funds rate but a lot of analysts and fed watchers believe that the fed will actually have to, will have to start cutting fed funds rate by no later than june of 2024 and if that indeed materializes then from June 2024 onwards or whenever the Fed actually starts cutting Fed funds rate, one needs to become very, very cautious because as we can see, going by historical precedence, the equity market top usually comes in within a very short period of time after that point where the Fed starts cutting Fed funds rate. So that's the strategy that we need to, we can consider adopting at this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the final parameter that we are going to discuss based on which we can potentially time the Nifty is called the yield curve inversion. Now, just like in case of the previous two parameters, yield curve inversion is also a topic on which I have already done a dedicated video on. I have already provided the link to that dedicated video in the description section of this video. I strongly encourage you to go and have a link, have a look at that dedicated video. But at this stage, I'm going to summarize what I had covered in that video anyways. Before we understand what exactly is the yield curve, we need to understand what are government bonds. Well, government bonds are an investment option for us through which we can give a loan to the government. When you invest in a government bond, you are essentially giving a loan to the government. Now, when it comes to US government bonds, there are bonds of various durations. You have short duration US government bonds, durations as short as three months. And then there, there are long duration US government bonds with duration as long as 10 years. When you invest in a three month US government bond, you're essentially giving a loan to the US government for a duration of three months. When you're investing in a 10 year US government bond, you are giving a loan to the US government for a period of 10 years. What difference it makes for you investing between a three month bond and a 10 year bond? Usually under normal circumstances. The rate of interest that you can earn from the US government by investing in a longer duration bond such as a 10 year bond, usually that is higher than the rate of interest that you can earn by investing in a shorter duration bond such as a 3 month bond. Now, if you want to visualize the yield curve and the difference between the rate of interest of a 10 year US government bond and the rate of interest of a 3 month US government bond, then the best way to do that is to plot the historical rate of return of a US government 10 year bond and the historical rate of return of a 3 month US government bond. What you see on, on the screen right now is this blue line. This blue line represents the historical yield, the historical interest that you could have earned by investing in a US government 10 year bond over the last 40 years. And the yellow line that you see right now is the historical rate of return, the historical yield that you could have earned by investing in a US government three month bond as you can very clearly see in this chart most of the times the blue line is above the yellow line which confirms the hypothesis that i just proposed a little while back usually under normal circumstances the 
yield on a 10 year US government bond is usually higher than the yield on a 3 month US government bond and that's why most of the times the blue line is above the yellow line. But there are exceptions to this rule. There are occasions when the yellow line goes above the blue line. And so the yield on a 3 month US government bond goes above the yield on a longer duration bond such as a 10 year bond. So as you can see, the this is where the yellow line went above the blue line. The yellow line went above the blue line once again here, again once again here, again once again here and once again here. And whenever the yellow line goes above the blue line, whenever the yield on a 3 month bond goes above the yield on a 10 year bond, this is the point where the yield curve is said, said to have inverted. If you want to visualize this very even more clearly, a better way to do that is to plot the difference between the blue line and the yellow line. The difference between the yield on a 10 year bond and the yield on a 3 month bond which is what I have done here. This red line that you see represents the difference between blue line and yellow line. This red line is nothing but the historical difference between the yield of a 10 year US government bond minus the yield on a 3 month US government bond. And since most of the time the blue line is above the yellow line, the blue line minus yellow line most of the, most of the time therefore is a positive number and that's why you see most of the time the red line is also above the zero level. This is the zero level and most of the time the red line is above the zero level. But whenever the yellow line goes above the blue line, this is when the difference between the blue line and the yellow line turns negative. And the difference between blue line and the yellow line turning negative means that this is the point where this red line dips below zero. And when the red line dips below zero, this is the point where the yield curve is said to have inverted. In the last 40 years, there have been four occasions when the yield curve has inverted. As you can see, these are the four times when the, this red line dis decisively went into negative territory. What is the impact of yield curve inversion on the economy as well as on the stock market? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be upfront. Historically, whenever the yield curve has inverted, that has always meant that bad things are going to follow for the economy as well as for the stock market. Let me deal with the impact on the economy first. The vertical pink bars that you see on the chart right now represent the periods when the US economy has witnessed recessions in the last 40 years. And as you can see, there is a very strong correlation between the incidence of yield curve inversion and the start of the next recession. Every time we have got a yield curve inversion, it has usually been followed by a recession. We got a yield curve inversion here, it was followed by a recession, yield curve inversion here, followed by a recession, yield curve inversion here, followed by a recession, again yield curve inversion here, this was followed by a recession. So this is the impact on the economy. Let's come to the impact on the stock market. Specifically, we are going to talk about the impact of a yield curve inversion in the US and its impact on Indian equity markets. And when we are assessing the impact on Indian equity markets, we are going to look at more specifically the last 20 years. So far we were looking at last 40 years, but now we are going to look at last 20 years because from the standpoint of Indian markets, last 20 years is when our economy and markets started to open up to foreign institutional inflows and hence this is the relevant period. And over the last 20 years, as you can see, there, there, are, there were two occasions when the yield curve inverted. Over the last 40 years, yield curve inverted four times. In the last 20 years, yield curve inverted twice. And on both those occasions, we had US recession, recessions in the US following soon thereafter. What was the impact of these recessions on Indian equity markets? Well, this blue line represents the chart of the Nifty. And as you can see, as soon as we had the recessions in the US in 2008 as well as in 2020, on both the occasions, we got very large stock market corrections. In 2008, as soon as the recession started in US, the Nifty made a top and after that, we got a massive 60% correction. What is even more remarkable is that the start of the recession in the US and the Nifty making a top, these two events almost exactly coincided. That's how strongly the onset of a recession in the US is linked to the Nifty making a top here in India. The same thing happened again in 2019. We had an inversion here and it was followed by a recession in 2020 and this recession caused a 38% correction here in India. 
Why does all these things matter at this stage? Ladies and gentlemen, these matter at this, at this stage because like it or not, we have got yet another inversion in the US bond market. Very recently, the yield curve inverted back in October of 2022. And as you can see, this red line has gone into negative, gone very, very deeply into negative territory. And if historical precedence is anything to go by, then this could well mean that at some point in time in the not too distant future, we could get a recession in the US and that in turn could trigger a large stock market correction here in India. So clearly it's time to be very, very careful. Now, what is it that we should do at this point in time now that the yield curve has inverted? Because the inversion of the yield curve almost confirms the fact that at some point in time we are going to get a recession and the recession is going to be accompanied by a large stock market correction. So should we what should we just sell all, all the equity in our portfolio and just move to a very defensive posture? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen the unequivocal answer is no. And the answer is no, because the inversion is only the first step in the run up to the next recession. Let's, let's understand that with the help of a few charts. So this is the yield curve versus the Nifty. The yield curve inverted for the first time in this century in around July of 2006. But the Nifty continued to rally for 17 months after that and the Nifty top came in only around January of 2008. For 17 months after inversion, we kept we, we saw the Nifty continuing to rally, rally. The same thing happened before COVID as well. Before COVID, the yield curve inverted around May of 2019. But the Nifty continued to rally for 8 months after that. The top in the Nifty came in only around January of 2020. And what has historically happened in the Nifty in the intervening period between the point when the yield curve inverts and the Nifty makes a top, usually this is a very, very good time for the Nifty. As you can see, between July 2006 and January 2008, during this time, the Nifty rallied a spectacular 109%. 109% rally in the Nifty basically means the Nifty more than doubled. So after the point the yield curve inverts, after that we got a doubling of the Nifty. Something similar happened before COVID as well. After the yield curve inverted, this time, once again, we got a rally. Of course, the scale of the rally this time was much smaller. We got only a 11% rally. But I believe that this time around, the rally was the scale of the rally was, was smaller because the rally was cut short because of the abrupt onset of the COVID pandemic. Had it not been for the COVID pandemic, I believe that this time around as well, the rally would have gone on for much longer and the scale of the rally would have been similar to the kind of this 109% kind of a rally that we saw between 2006 and 2008. What has been happening in, in, in the markets uh, since the most recent inversion that we have got? As I just mentioned, we got the most recent inversion in October of 2022. And since then, the Nifty has rallied a spectacular 29%. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is slightly counterintuitive. Once the yield curve inverts, that in a way confirms that at some point in time we are going to get a recession and that recession is going to trigger a large stock market correction. But that doesn't mean that you should sell all your equity holdings and move to a very defensive posture as soon as the yield curve inverts because hist going by the history of equity markets, had you done that, you would have missed out on very large rallies. Had you sold everything just at the point of inversion, then between 2006 and 2008, you would have missed out on this massive 109% rally. Before COVID, you would have missed out on this 11% rally. And more recently, you would have missed out on this nearly 30% rally that we have seen over the last one year or so. Right? So, yield curve inversion is the point, is definitely not the point at which you should move to a defensive posture. But if yield curve inversion is not the point where you move to a defensive posture, then what is a better time to do so? Well, the better time to do so is when the yield curve uninverts. So, what exactly is uninversion? As we saw in 2006, the yield curve inverted. 
once the yield curve inverts this red line starts to go below zero but once this red line goes below zero at some point in time this red line starts to go back up again and eventually this red line goes above zero once again and the point at which this red line once again goes back above zero is the point at which the yield curve is said to have uninverted so before the 2008 crash the yield curve uninverted in august of 2007 and then just within five months the nifty made a top in january 2008 and the recession started and we got this large stock market correction something very similar happened before covid the yield curve this time around uninverted in october of 2019 and then the market top came in just three months later in january of 2020. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we can very clearly see, the once the yield curve uninverts, after that the market makes a top very, very soon, very, very soon thereafter. It's not as if that the rally ends immediately after the yield curve uninverts. In fact, the rally continues for some time after that. But in terms of the distance, the point of uninversion is far closer to the point where the Nifty makes a top compared to the point at which the yield curve inverts. And hence to that extent, if at all you are planning to time the Nifty and if you are planning to get out of the Nifty, get out of your equity portfolio at a point close to the recession, at the point close to, at, at, at a point which is very close to the point of the potential market peak, then the point of uninversion is a very useful point because usually after that within a couple of months the market makes a top and the eventual crash starts so if at all you intend to time the nifty you can consider gradually getting out of your of your equity portfolio after the yield curve uninverts what is the status of the most recent inversion that we have had most recently the yield curve inverted back in october of 2022 but since then the yield curve continues to remain inverted as we can see the red line continues to be below zero but we can also see that the red line has started to go up once again and once the red line starts to go up once again it basically means that at some point in time it will continue it will continue to go up and ultimately it will go back above zero and the point where it goes back above zero that's the point where the yield curve would have uninverted and that's the point where we have to become really 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 cautious because going by historical precedence once the yield curve uninverts it basically means that the equity markets are going to make a top within a very 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 short period of time so from the standpoint of timing the nifty the point of uninversion is far more important than the point of inversion so now that we have gone through each of these three key market inflection points and market parameters let's now try to build the investment strategy that we had sought to build during the course of this episode so here's my simple proposition to anyone who wants to time their exit from the equity market my proposition is that you should stay fully invested in equity markets until the three conditions that i'm going to lay down now have all been met. I repeat, you should stay fully invested in the equity market until the time the three conditions that I'm going to lay down have all been met. So what are these three conditions? The first condition is that the balance in the RRP should have gone down to zero or to a point very, very close to zero. Now, this is something that we have discussed many times during the course of this series that the balance in the RRP has been pretty much the fuel that has been fueling the rally that we have seen in pretty much most equity markets around the world over the last one year. So the continuation of this rally is quite significantly contingent upon there being a balance in the RRP. So till such time that there is a balance in the RRP, one should continue to stay fully invested in equity markets. What is the second condition? The second condition is that the Fed should have started to cut rates. And by rates, I mean the Fed funds rate, FFR. Because we have seen during the course of this series that the F Fed starting to cut rates is almost a prerequisite of sorts before a recession actually materializes. So the Fed must start to cut Fed funds rate. And the final condition that must be met is that the yield curve must uninvert. Uninversion of the yield curve basically means that the yield on a 10-year US government bond should go back above the level of a 
three month US government bond. When that happens, the yield curve basically would have uninverted. And as we have seen during the course of this series, that the yield curve uninversion is all also one of the key prerequisites of sorts that needs to be in place before a recession kicks in and before a material stock market correction can kick in. So we should stay fully invested in equity markets unless of course all these three conditions are met and once all these three conditions are met at that point in time we should start to plan our exit from equity markets in a gradual manner over a, mat over a matter of couple of weeks. Now, if you navigate the markets based on this strategy, I think there's a very, very high chance that you will be able to stay invested in the equity markets up until a point that is very, very close to when the market eventually makes a market top and you'll be able to reliably get out of the markets very, very safely well in advance before eventually a material correction kicks in. Ladies and gentlemen, before concluding this video, I wish to reiterate that any market timing logic that I might have discussed during the course of uh, this particular episode is solely based on market trends and market behavior observed in the past. Now, while market behavior in the past can be very, very useful guidance for predicting what can possibly happen in the future, there is no guarantee that markets in future will continue to behave in line with their past behavior. This is something that you must keep in mind. There is no logic, there is no market timing logic that is cast in stone. Every market timing logic is subject to failure. Every market timing logic can and will fail at some point in time. So this is something that you must keep in mind at all times, especially if you are trying to time equity markets. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of this video. I hope I was able to add some value by way of the strategy that I proposed during the course of this episode to time the ongoing equity rally. If you like this strategy and if you like the contents of this video, please do like and share this video and please do consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you very much.